Today we celebrate the holy apostle, theologian, and evangelist John. On September 26, his translation from this life, the end of his life, and his body was actually not found after it was buried. So that's why we say he was translated on this day into eternal life. St. John was, according to the flesh, the nephew of Jesus. Jesus was his uncle. Of course, St. Joseph, the betrothed, had seven children by his first wife before she died. Four sons and three daughters. One of those daughters was named Salome, whom we hear about elsewhere in the Gospels. And John was the, daughter, John was the son of Zebedee, and his mother was Salome, the daughter of St. Joseph the betrothed. So therefore, through this step relationship, Jesus was his uncle, according to the world. So he had this familial relationship with Jesus. He was the beloved disciple. He was the one who reclined on Jesus' breast as they ate the Last Supper. He was the only one of the twelve disciples not to abandon Christ at the cross. He was the one Jesus entrusted his mother to as he hung from the cross. He was the only one of the twelve disciples who did not die as a martyr, but lived to the age of uh, 105. And during that time, he spent most of his time uh, after Jerusalem in Ephesus, except for 15 years when he was exiled on the waterless island of Patmos, where he spent 15 years and where he wrote the book of Revelation, the last book of the scriptures. He also leaves us, of course, his gospel and three letters. The first letter in particular is beloved by the church, 1 John. Last night at Vespers, during the readings for Vespers, we read basically all of chapters 3, 4, and 5 from 1 John. And today we read again a selection from chapter 4. This is a famous section. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. Then he says in this section, he says, God is love. A famous quote. And finally, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. These are all extremely important quotes that all come to us from today's epistle reading. And actually, about 600 years ago, on this very day, St. Gregory Palamas, the Archbishop of Thessaloniki, delivered a sermon that is preserved for us on this great apostle. And he, it's as if it was written today. And he wants to tease out for us what is the nature of this love that St. John is constantly talking about. Love, love, love. So St. Gregory Palamas explains to us that there are two kinds of love that are interdependent. They cannot be separated from one another. They are mutually dependent. But they are two different kinds of love. The first is, of course, the love for God, our love for God. St. Gregory tells us, quoting from St. John's writings, his many writings, he says, the sign of our love for God is, of course, that we keep his word and his commandments. This is what John 8.31 tells us, 1 John 5.3. The Lord himself says in John 14, he who loves me will keep my commandments. Then in John 15, he says, this is my commandment, that you love one another. And then John 13, by this shall all men, all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So this is a recurring theme. If we love him, we follow his commandments, the first of which is to love one another. And then St. Gregory tells us beautifully that we are called to offer something. We are called to do something. Love is an action verb. But we are imperfect humans, so how do we reconcile this? St. Gregory tells us, if something is lacking on account of our human frailty, the Lord is gracious and will make up for the deficiencies due to our weaknesses by means of his grace. 
accepting us as though our good works were perfect, particularly if he sees us humbled by our failures in virtue and not conceited over our virtuous achievements. If he sees us not conceited by whatever little we may accomplish and in fact humbled by our failures, which we are constantly evaluating as we examine ourselves and come to confession, if he sees this humbling in us, then he is quick to cover us with his grace and to accept as perfect whatever we try to offer him in an imperfect way. So love for God, the first of these two kinds of love, is the most straightforward. But the second kind of love, the love for our neighbor, loving one another, what does this look like? St. John says again and again, especially his famous John 3.16 that we all know, he says that God demonstrated his love for us first by sending his only begotten son. So since God has clearly demonstrated his love for us when we were still sinners, it's easy, St. John says, to return the love of someone who first showed love to us. But what about our neighbor? What about the other. Here, St. John says, it's actually the next verse after the reading ended today. He says, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. That's what it says. 1 John 4.20. If someone says, I love God and he hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen... How can he love God whom he has not seen? Now this is interesting because I wonder if that's the way everyone saw things in, in St. John's day. Because in our day, it seems to me almost that the opposite is happening. It's easy for us to love the abstract other. The other that we don't know and that we don't see necessarily, but we think of as our neighbor. It's the common good divorced from any particular person, any particular specific concrete human being, but instead an abstract other, an abstract neighbor. It's easy to love those people because they don't annoy us. They're not specific people who we have to deal with on a daily basis, who maybe say things that they shouldn't say or do things that they shouldn't do. Those are people that are hard to love because they're concrete and so St. John is always referring to loving those in the community, in the church, because it forces us to love the other who is right in front of our face, who is a specific, frail, imperfect human being, unlike God. This is, this is what we're called to do, brothers and sisters, to love these people, to love specific people, not just to love abstract other, but specific human persons. I heard uh, an analogy one time that said, you know, a, a parish is like a bag of sharp rocks, a bag of sharp rocks. And you take that bag and you shake it and you shake it and those sharp rocks are hitting each other, smashing against each other within this contained bag. And if you keep doing this over time, when you open the bag and take the rocks out, they will be smoothed. The sharp edges will be blunted. This is what happens in community life. This is what happens within the community of faith, the church. We are put together in communion, and St. John starts his letter today, 1 John, by announcing to us that God has revealed the communion that exists within himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that that communion has been extended to us. That communion has been opened up and we are invited in to this communion together. And we are invited to be that communion together, all together as individuals here and with God. But to do that, sometimes these sharp rocks have to hit each other and hit each other and hit each other. And finally, over time, they are smoothed out and become useful. This is what is happening to us in the church, as we are in communion with specific, concrete 
human persons who are complicated. There's no black and white. There are shades of gray. It's easy to love someone who agrees with us and meets this ideological purity test and is completely one way or completely another. But unfortunately, most of us don't exist in one of those two extremes. Life is complicated. Human persons are complicated. And so it becomes much easier to love someone who is not an ideology, but is a human person. This is the communal life. This is what love for neighbor looks like. St. Gregory tells us more specifically, what does this love look like between members of the community? And he says, each of you should benefit your neighbor in all sorts of ways by means of what you have. He says, God is not asking us to help our neighbor with something we don't have. If we don't have money, then he's not asking us to help with money. If we don't have a singing talent, he's not asking us to help with singing. He's asking us to help with what we have at our disposal. And so St. Gregory continues, are you unable to heal the sick with a miraculous word? You can still heal them with a word of encouragement. This is what St. Gregory says. We can't heal the sick by our word like Jesus and the apostles, but we can heal with a word of encouragement within this community that we have been bound in for our salvation. He continues, if you personally minister to someone's needs, you yourself, and he says, how amazing is this? You yourself will have the Lord to serve you in the age to come. In accordance with his own words, where he says in Luke chapter 12, assuredly I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. He's talking about himself as the son of man when he returns. If we serve others, he will serve us in the kingdom. St. Gregory continues, Perhaps you do not have words to teach and exhort people to be virtuous, the power to rebuke, to turn men away from evil and toward virtue. Become a teacher then by your actions, doing good for yourself and your neighbor. If they find you intolerable and direct insults at you, if they fabricate lying accusations and contrive terrible plots against you, stand firm. Do not turn aside or weaken and change your course, but be kind to yourself and to them, looking to the example of Christ and his beloved disciples. So this is the second piece, love for neighbor. First, love for God. Second, and dependent on the first, love for neighbor. And third, and finally, St. Gregory addresses, how do we know if we have this kind of love, this perfect love that exists in communion with the Holy Trinity and with one another? How do we know if we are following the Lord's command to love one another? St. Gregory says beautifully, he says, if you long to know the signs of this love within you, I will show you them but only on the condition that you go on tirelessly to find them yourself. He's going to share with you some of his experiences. He says, this is how you know whether you have this love in you. When you lift your mind up to God, and nothing earthly attracts it, but forgetting everything without force and free from thoughts, you joyfully delight in the remembrance of God and prayers to him. Then be aware that you have clearly apprehended love for God and share in it for as long as this converse, this conversation or rather union with God continues. If you find yourself in prayer and you find yourself experiencing what St. Gregory is describing, where you are free from worldly attachments and thoughts, then you know that you have this divine love for as long as that feeling continues. He says, again, when you pray to the Lord, and again, both of these are within the context of prayer, when you pray to the Lord with contrition and sweet pain in your heart, equally for yourself and for every man, known to you or unknown, friend or foe, whether or not he has grieved you, then know that you love your neighbor from your soul. If you are standing there in prayer with contrition and sweet pain of heart, with love and prayer for all men, then you know that you have this love. 
By God's grace, a few times in my life, I have felt exactly what St. Gregory is talking about 600 years ago and what St. John wrote about 2,000 years ago. By God's grace, I have had a taste, a taste, a short taste occasionally of what he's talking about. And what he's talking about is worth sacrificing everything for. Like the man who sold everything to buy, this, to buy the pearl of great price. It's worth sacrificing everything for, for there is no experience like this. When you sit before God and feel in communion with him and the Holy Trinity. But how do we do this? How do we get that feeling and how, most importantly, do we hold on to that feeling? St. Gregory says, these dispositions, these feelings will not become yours unless you possess the visible works of love. For if you do not accustom yourself to giving up your own will and do your neighbor's will, how can you endure the things that he brings upon you? If you do not courageously and patiently bear the difficulties caused by men, how will you progress to praying for your enemies, as Christ tells us. So St. John is calling us to this perfect love of both God and man, but man in a specific sense. Yes, it also includes this abstract sense, praying for the well-being of all human persons unknown to us, but he specifically includes we must have that same feeling to the very people who aggravate us, to those very people who make up stories about us. These people we must love as well. These people who grieve us. Then we will know that our love is true and that we are truly following the Lord's command to love one another. <clears throat> I'll end with, with this. <clears throat> There's a story about St. John the Apostle. In his dying days in Ephesus, Ephesus is located kind of central west, modern day Turkey. And interestingly, I read there was a, a new discovery not too long ago of some manuscripts. And it, it's, it's church fathers <clears throat> talking about at the end of the third century, so in the 290s, something like this, they're talking, and there's a letter preserved in which they refer not as reporting something new, but refer in passing to the fact that the original writing of St. John's Gospel, the one that was written by his actual hand, was venerated inside the church of Ephesus at their time, in the late 200s. And that people, the scribes who are making copies of St. John's Gospel, would actually travel to Ephesus and get permission to check the copies against the original. This was happening in the late 200s in St. John's church in Ephesus that he founded. And St. Jerome tells us about the end of the Apostle John's life. He lived, remember, to 105 years old. And he became very weak in his old age. And his disciples actually had to carry him to the church. He would be in the church, but he was no longer able to give sermons. So he, was reduced, so he reduced his teaching because of his weakness. He reduced his teaching to unceasingly repeating the following line, little children love one another. Little children love one another. Little children love one another. One day when his disciples asked him why he kept repeating this one phrase incessantly, he replied to them, this is the Lord's commandment, and if you keep it, that is enough. So little children, let us love one another in honor of St. John, the theologian and evangelist and apostle today. I mean.